This afternoon, The Devil Never Sleeps will screen on the DCP, courtesy of the Harvard Film Archive. Uh, my name is Sophia Serrano. I'm assistant curator here at the Academy Museum, and I curated the gallery on Lourdes Portillo, um, up on our second floor, Stories of Cinema. Um, you know, before I bring Lourdes and Vivian out, I just want to say uh, it was just so wonderful working with her on the gallery. Um, and thinking about her body of work and the filmography and putting it into kind of perspective in, in you know, the space that we have. Um, the Devil Never Sleeps is one of her key works um, and really is one of her most personal works. And so I'm very excited to be delving into that and talking about it with her today. So with that, um, I'd love to welcome Lourdes Portillo and her, the editor of the film, uh, Vivian Hillgrove, to the stage. You know, the first thing I just want to talk about is the kind of significance of Devil Never Sleeps. And, you know, I mentioned very briefly, but it, it's just such a beautiful personal film, but also embodies so much about your style and your kind of vision um, and, you know, just your overall approach. It has humor, but it also has mystery and that there's a lot of serious um, themes that you're dealing with, but it's also self-reflective in such an interesting way. Um, and I just think it's so beautiful and such an important work out of your filmography. Um, so we highlighted a variety of ways in the gallery. Um, but I think before going into that a little bit, I would love to have you kind of share, like, you know, your first ideas around the film and then, you know, how long it took you to make it and kind of your process overall. Sure. B but first of all, I just want to say thank you so much, Sophia. You have been an incredible curator. And I want to thank, you know, the Academy for inventing a museum for them. For them. I, I think it's enormously important, and I'm just very happy to have been invited. You know, that was a great thing for me. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and uh, also, uh, Vivian is here with me, that she's gone the whole way all the time with all my films, and your first question was, I'm sorry, I forgot <laughs> no, it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an old I person. I threw a lot at you, so it's okay. Uh, but just like how, you know, you kind of talk about in the documentary, but like just the, when you first hear of Theo Oscar's death, and there's just like all these different stories coming out, and it feels very surreal, um, and then kind of deciding to like document it or kind of delve into that um, and, right. and really like push what that experience was like and put it and share it with the public. Um, right. So I'm curious like what that kind of early experience was like, you know, what was your process like? Did you talk to your family about making the doc? And then, you know, like how long did it take from like the idea to starting to actually make it? Um, you know, what that, what that was like? Yes, I think it, the story... It, it happened to me, it was a telephone story that my mother was telling me about, you know, my uncle. And I was living in New York at that time in the East Coast and um, I couldn't believe it. And I would tell, you know, the person I was staying with, this is so terrible, this, I can't live through this. This is like a telenovela yeah. that never ends, you know. and. And she said, well, it's like a documentary, right? <laughs> and I thought, yes, you're right, it's like a documentary. Mm -hmm. So and that, at that moment, when I was on the phone, I realized that this would make a wonderful documentary. And it was a matter of just following it, mm -hmm. always following it and always being ve very aware of uh, recording it or writing it down. And um, I think it was easy enough, you know, to create kind of a story from it. And I did that and I started the fundraising. The fundraising actually came very quickly. People were very interested in this. And, um, and ITVS supported me mm -hmm. and uh, Jim Yee was there, and he supported me all the way, even in ways that no one has been supported before. Mm. And that enabled me to, um, you know, to, sh to shoot the film. And I knew that I couldn't really do a, a, I mean, I had to think about the style. I was in New York, so I was thinking about style, 
<laughs> and uh, so I saw everything, and I I decided on the style because I, you know, that's the only money really I had was to really be a, to do a documentary. So um, yeah, it took probably about nine months to fundraise and to start shooting and then finding the crew. The crew, I had already worked with this enormously talented, you know, editor that I've worked with for many years. And, uh, and then I found an enormously talented cinematographer. And then I had my friend, the sound man, who I've known since I don't know when. And uh, I have like a tribe of people that have supported me through my career. And they have been so key to my work, so key. And they are so in tune with who I am and how sick I am. <laughs> 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 so they encourage that illness, you know. <laughs> Indeed. But it's, it, it is kind of an illness, but it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great thing mm -hmm. to, to feel that cinema can be many things. It doesn't have to be one way of narrating, but it could be a very complex way of narrating, an interesting way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's about as far as I can get with my memory about what you asked me. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> well, and then I'm curious, Vivian, um, you know, as well, if you could just talk about when you, like Lourdes first told you about the project, but then also, you know, what you work on before and how your your work dynamic was and, you know, has evolved? Um, well, first of all, when I, I have to say that it's been the greatest honor to work with you for 30 years and eight films. It just, um, it's you're beautiful. like, We're I love you. <laughs> I love yeah. you so much. Me too. So when I first saw Lorda, she walked into a restaurant and I, I just looked over and I, just the way she walked in, I said, I'm with her. <laughs> I just liked your whole attitude. It just was, you know, very, you were very sure of yourself and you walked in with great determination and I thought, that woman can really make a movie. I know it. And so I just, from the very get-go, we just got along like, you know, sisters. sisters. You know, it was like we could read each other's minds somehow and, and it was just like the most marvelous relationship and to this day, we call each other twice a week, you know, and it's th that, that, job turned into a, you know, three decade friendship that's like no other. It's just an extraordinary thing. So when she first started telling me about the, um, her film, I had met Lourdes on uh, um, La Ofrenda, which was the first film I worked on with her. And I had been uh, a sound editor, a dialogue editor in particular on feature films and then did a couple of big films as a picture editor. But, but it was tell them which ones, dear. Well. Yeah, you <laughs> said mention them. Uh, sound editing, um, r The Right Stuff, Never Cry Wolf, Amadeus, Blue Velvet, Twin Peaks. Um, just a few, just, just to name a few. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> just a little nothing. It's yeah. a humble job. Being a dialogue <laughs> is a humble, very yeah. humble job. <laughs> but I love it because you're very close to the story and you're close to the actors mm -hmm. in so many ways. So that was always my passion is to kind of, you know, uh, be in that kind of realm. But then there's, you know, this kind of dark night of the soul of what uh, what am I really doing and where are we really going? And then I met Lourdes and it just, I just quit features like that. Mm -hmm. And I just thought my heart has been captured by documentaries and Lourdes Portillo. Oh. So you oh, changed you. my life in the best of ways, honey. You just, it was, it was a blessing. Was that going out with a drunk? <laughs> 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 See what I mean? It's like friggin' fantastic. <laughs> and Lourdes, you know, she's Susan Lourdes, you know, she moves the edges of this box that is called a documentary, right? Yeah. She it keeps expanding it until you come into work one day and there's no friggin' box left. <laughs> you know, I mean you can go in any direction. You could your imagination can flower and blossom in this kind of relationship where you the thing you say and you're the greatest storyteller I've ever met features or otherwise. I mean, you just are amazing. And in the process of doing this story, she is telling me stories about her family that are just remarkable, that inspire you and, and 
allow you to enter that world, right? So it, and then we had photographs all over the wall from the film, and so that when you walk into the edit room, you are in that space, and it really helped mm -hmm. to um, figure out how all these characters come together. They have their own trajectories, right? They have their this amazing thing that Lourdes does, which is she's telling a story about um, Oscar, Tio Oscar, but underneath everybody is telling a story about themselves, mm -hmm. actually, because you learn more about those characters and about their ethics and about their the sweetness of your mother, the the strength of your father, the craziness of Luce, <laughs> you know, and, and on and on, and, and it is such a remarkable coming up from a deep surface to exposing uh, everything these people are in the process of talking about Oscar. So that was, it just was this three-dimensional chess that was fantastically wonderful to work on because you're the bomb, man. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you're Viv, the bomb. no, but Viv, <laughs> the thing is, is that Vivian is the most intuitive, the most um, aesthetically kind of driven person, and that was like what made it look so nice and so wonderful. Viv, you have been, y y she knows everything about music and timing and, uh, and sound, and I mean, you, you, made my, you made me look good. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that is, a, I, what's interesting too is like the, the, the kind of way the narrative is woven, um, you know, like you're talking, like the films leading up to Devil Never Sleeps, I would say, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but are a little more traditional format of documentary, um, kind of a lot more straightforward, whereas yeah. this is much more experimental. Mm -hmm. um, like the documentation is really about like the surreal or like the unknown. Um, and that it, it's like this, these fictional stories and like the weaving together. But then there's also these elements of it that are, you know, like the shots of like mirrors or the sky or the area. Mm -hmm. And so there's like this other current of it. It's the characters and their narratives about themselves, but it's also about that location and that area and the kind of like existence in that area and just like one little story from what's happening in that culture. Um, and so I'm curious like a little bit like with, like was there kind of like interviews first and then were you kind of like doing a lot of footage of, you know, like more experimental or was it kind of all melded together? You got it. Yeah. That's how it was. Melded together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. right. That's, yeah. that's, that's a, you, you got it, you got the process. Yeah. Um, you can go do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then are there, were there like different cuts to it? Like did you have different versions? Were there things that like didn't make the film that you like wish like you would have kind of done, you know, added or like things that you would kind of reflect on differently now? Not at all. I mean, I, I, I you know, uh, there were, there are things that you know that you see with time that you know they don't translate to the epoch, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, so that you know they, it should be the kind of uh, tailored to the epoch in a way, and I think about that, but I think that all the things that we put in there have a significance of not just like an aesthetic significance, like for example, uh, I had the most incredible. Uh, cinematographer, Kyle Kibbe, you know, and uh, an incredible sound man. Everybody, everybody was just on uh, there, there. And you see them when we're in the motel room. Mm -hmm. You see how we're all engaged in this thing. Mm -hmm. And um, you see, I'm older now, so I forgot what I was going to say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, I, I, I think... Um, the story kind of told itself chronologically, you know? It happened kind of chronologically, mm -hmm. and uh, that was very helpful, mm -hmm. yeah. So like what we're seeing is kind of as you were encountering it in a way, so we're really following your investigation yes. directly. Yes. And then like when you finally, like the phone call with Ophelia is coming in, like at that point you'd already 
for at that point in exploring mm -hmm. the different exactly. stories. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Ophelia is such like an interesting looming character, right? Because it's just this mm -hmm. voice that you have exactly. there. Right. Um, and I, f I feel like that's one of the most fascinating parts where she finally comes in and that phone call happens and you're like, the, just like the different contradictions that come in. Um, and I thought that the editing is great there too because you're hearing this voice or a lot of times there's voiceover, like Lourdes is walking us through something and then like the visuals are like really help in this way. Sometimes they're not actually directly related, you're not seeing it, but like there's this other layer, like the bridal mannequin in the store and just like right. thinking about that, I think that is incredibly well done. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. What Thanks. Lourdes does that's so fantastic is that leaves to the audience this fun, it's almost like a puzzle uh, that all, all also the audience is figuring out at the same time and doesn't give too much or too little information, mm -hmm. right? So it's just, it keeps in engaging people. And, and I remember when you had come into the edit room and we had uh, woven uh, some scenes together and whatever, and then you say, oh, and by the way, um, Oscar is an acupuncturist. And I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> what are like, what are you talking about? And every story, like Lourdes would parcel out sometimes some things, and then every day my mind was blown, you know. And I just thought, God, this is a whole different way of making films. It's so fantastic, you know. It's so great. And you were such a great captain to this ship because everybody was, you know, kind of taking their their cues from you to kind of, like what was what was possible in your one job what was possible in like interpreting how many how many um metaphors can fit inside of an allegory right it's just like <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> and so there was you know it just felt like the first job i'd ever had where there were no limits to your what you could imagine and what you could accomplish there's such a freedom that you give people well it's extraordinary i i, I feel that documentary has given me that you know, I mm. feel that the fact that uh, in order to make a documentary, you don't really have to go to a studio and try to raise so much money mm -hmm. and uh, have uh, somebody else write it and somebody else direct it and, or, uh, you know, write it or produce it and then you direct it. Um, I thought you can do it all. Mm. You know, I come from you know, having had the experience, the incredible experience of having gone to art school at the San Francisco Art Institute and having a teacher like George Kushar. Mm. And I don't know if you guys know George Kushar, but George was uh, a, a filmmaker and he made everything in, in low end, you know, film equipment and films and, you know, with no money and all that. And that's what he taught us. Mm. and. I mean, he opened the door to me. He, I remember when I was in class, we were in class and, you know, we didn't have anything at the Art Institute. It was an empty room with chairs. And he said, we're going to make a film that is set in a cruise ship. <laughs> and there's nothing in the room. Right, and, and, and we're going to shoot it now. You know, how do you, how do you recreate a cruise ship, you know? And so he taught us how to do that, mm. you know, with ingenuity, with no money. And uh, so I have, and I'm also Mexican, of course. I can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was one of the, uh, you know, most impressive things. So Lourdes' archive is up at Stanford University, and so mm -hmm. spent a lot of time reviewing it in preparation for the exhibition. Um, and just the, like, determination to get a film made. Like, all the letters, all the proposals, all the grants, and just, like, mm -hmm. reaching out to so many different people, like, getting them involved in the project, making them buy into your vision. Um, it was just tremendous, hundreds of letters per project, mm. really, and like, just the amount of, of work to make that come together, you know, I think one aspect of it is that there's like portability and independent filmmaking and, you know, you, that you produce and you write and you're doing so much of every project, 
Um, but I want to underscore how much work it takes to really get it made. And like that, the, the producing of it too is yeah. just such a phenomenal effort. Um, and yeah. you know, really takes a lot, even if it's you know low budget or you know independent. Um, That's right. You know, and it, it took a, especially with Devil Never Sleeps. Um, you know, your prior films had had a lot of success, and I think then making, um, you know, like getting this idea of like finally putting more of a personal story on display um, was really interesting to see how that's framed and talked about. Thank you for observing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Vivian is making her first documentary. Oh, you are. What's the? What's? The, can you tell us about it? It's a secret. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come back in six months, and we'll tell us about it. It's a different animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a. It's sort of a memoir about blindness, uh, in okay. in various forms. Huh. And when you were making Devil Never Sleeps, were you in Mexico as well, Vivian, or were you um, like kind of commu like to communicating remotely? Like, was footage being sent up to you, or like, w were you on set? Really started didn't wasn't it? Um, I, uh, I went to the set one time, but uh, uh, normally she was in the motel when I'm looking at the. Uh, yeah. I, I, Vivian was there. Okay. Yeah. But she one day. One yeah, day. One okay. Day. But basically, yeah, yeah. started working after all the dailies were in. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, going through and the seeing the transcripts mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's when I really started. Okay. And can you tell yeah. us a little bit about um, like the projects you worked on after Devil Never Sleeps, or kind of you know your collaboration and how that evolved, and you know like was there a certain style um, that you feel like. You kind of arrived at this more experimental, which really does stay throughout your career. This kind of mixing of, you know, the the kind of taking the no limits of documentary, um, very, <laughs> very seriously, li seriously yeah. very literally. Um, and I'm curious, like, if you felt like that, like this was kind of a starting point that you really evolved um, in other projects, and if so, which? Yeah, I. Uh, did you ask Vivian? No, no you. Yeah. you. No, no, no. No, do you. I can't remember, Viv. I can't either. We're both old. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, no. No. <clears throat> After that was uh, Corpus. That's right. Corpus, uh, 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 love, uh, uh, um, letter to Selena. Yeah. And then uh, th there was. Um, oh, uh, sorry, I'm s I'm going backwards in time instead of forwards in time. Yeah. Uh, Columbus on trial. Oh, that's right, Columbus. Signorita Extraviata. Uh -huh. um, yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, Columbus on trial. Uh, and um, well, we already know two or three, four, five. Academics. Yeah. The academics thing. Um, then we have uh, uh, Amasaya. Yeah. And then we have... Um, uh, <laughs> I don't, you see, uh, we, uh, the, we um, forget, and because oh, we're also working on other things at the same time, time. right? Yeah, right, and, 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 or we're and we're also sitting things. up here with lights yeah. on us, yeah. Yeah. so we yeah. can't yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I no, think no, I'm no. just more well because thinking about you know one of the things that we highlight in the gallery and that we've talked about a lot is like memory and how that's manifested in the documentaries and. Um, you know, for example, like if we look at Las Madres early, like there's very kind of direct testimonies or direct like kind of correlation to what we're talking about. But then when we get to like Cinderita Extraviada, we have like more like the sequ like more experimental sequences, um, you know, and that's also screening as part of the series um, that where it's like the disappearance and memory um, of right. like kind of how do you show or embody someone that's missing when you don't have that kind of direct uh, kind of evidence or, you know, direct knowledge of what's happening? Mm -hmm. So there's, like, similar things here where it's, like, Tito Oscar, like, you know, he's gone. We don't know quite what happened. We're trying to figure it out. Um, and then similar, like, you know, at least there's kind of a way in which um, Senor Dex Straviata kind of melds these things stylistically. Like we have the mothers talking about their children and where they, like what they think happened or what they've experienced, that idea of memory. Um, but then there's also like this kind of accepting the unknown and um, having to 
manifest that through, for example, like showing like their items in their room or, you know, the kind of after, like what's left of the trace of someone and trying to figure that out. Um, Love what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <I'm just laughs> these are things we've talked oh. about. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, I think that, that that's uh, interesting to see how pivotal Devil Never Sleeps is in, in mm -hmm. your career. Um, and I think it, it obviously, I wonder, like it must have been kind of vulnerable to put your family uh, kind of on display in that way. And really courageous. Well, th I mean, it, 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 it was really hard because, you know, people don't like that. It, it, this is, I was breaking a lot of uh, mm. taboo, you know, and some, some of my relatives are not in agreement with me. You know, they say you you know you don't wash your dirty clothes in in front of uh, everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, but at that time, I was uh, younger, and uh, I felt bolder. And I thought that's okay. It's okay to say to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and w we maintain that kind of attitude throughout all the films. I think. Yeah. Yeah, that the truth is just really cannot be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes documentary filmmakers do sacrifice the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there's any, how do we feel if we want to have any questions from the audience? Is there anything anyone would like to ask, um, give an opportunity? Yeah, sure, sorry. Uh, yeah. No, uh, no, no. Uh, you know, I could only go so far. Um, first of all, I didn't have the time. I didn't have the money because that's what you need with the whole crew when you have, you know, somebody, you know, with you. Many people trying, not many. I mean, we were four or five, but, you know, it costs money. So I just, you know, I, do I want to engage in a, an, in a search Again, I, I had to make do with what I had done. Mm -hmm. And I also just one small, sorry, <laughs> I'm cutting in real quick. Um, like just this idea of like the line or like the, the boundary. I mean, I think with your family, they obviously like were aware of what they were saying in the interviews and kind of understood, you know, to a certain extent, I'm imagining, you know, understood yeah. to a certain extent, but then it's just like, once you you see it all come together and you see all the different stories, that can be a very different experience um, and kind of have a certain reaction, but it makes sense in a way that you're treating like what your family's saying as its own kind of artifact and not like mm -hmm. digging necessarily too much further. Um, I right. think it, c it kind of implied, you know, right. Uh, th it, th it was by implication. They're mm -hmm. telling us everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So I, d I didn't see the point in torturing them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, and then also, I just wanted to talk. Uh, I Sorry, uh, going back real quick. Um, That's okay. the, the use of telenovelas, yeah. um, which I absolutely sure. love and we play with in the gallery, you know, the in the gallery we feature one of the marketing materials where each family member is cast as a member of a telenovela. Mm -hmm. um, and so you see like the different kind of breaking down the different characters and you know how they, they would play out as if they were in on TV. Um, and then we also have like a vintage TV playing clips from the film where you have telenovelas coming in. Um, and I'm curious about that idea like where did you come up with that to integrate it directly into the doc? It, it was there in front of me all the time. You know, we would go someplace, like we went to um, to do an interview and we couldn't do it because people, we, when you eat in Mexico and where, where I come from, you know, people don't attend to business at that moment, at that time when they're eating. So we have to wait, you know? We have to wait for people to finish eating it. And lunch is not one hour, it's more. And uh, so we would wait, and, and, and that the, the telenovela came up when we were in a store, and, 
and the ladies were watching the telenovela mm -hmm. when we were waiting for people to finish eating. And then it happened several times. Mm -hmm. So I said, let's get this because it's mm -hmm. so indicative of what is happening, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the like cutting to them is like r really appropriate, like right at the perfect moment to like kind of right. parallel it. So exactly. that was really well done. Um, I'm being notified that we are actually up on time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I feel like we could talk for another hour up here, but I just wanted to say thank you so much and. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really glad that we could have you here to give a little context to the film, and I look forward to working with you in the future on other things as well. And thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.